right? That's the last time you're going to see that little bumper video. We have been in the book of Acts for eight years. <laughs> Feels like it, doesn't it? We actually began the last Sunday in May of 2022. We will wrap it up today. We're coming in for a landing. The wheels are out on the plane. We're going to finish the last two chapters, chapter 27 and 28. The key, the key verse for this entire series is Acts 1-8. And this is Jesus speaking right after he has commissioned the disciples to launch the church, to preach the gospel, to make disciples, to wait for the advocate that he was going to send, the Holy Spirit. So here's what he said. After the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. Everybody say power. power. You will receive explosive power, dynamite power. That word in the Greek is dunamis. It's where we get the English word dynamite. So Jesus is saying, I am about to empower you so you can carry out the mission that I have given you. After the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive that power to be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. And that's what happened. The Holy Spirit showed up. Jesus sent into heaven, sat at the right hand of the Father. The disciples and other people were in the upper room when the Holy Spirit showed up. Peter preached, 3,000 people got saved, and then the rest is history. The work of the Holy Spirit began to move in and through the church, and it began to spread from Jerusalem to Judea, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. A man named Saul had an experience with Jesus. He was touched by Jesus, and his life was completely changed. And he went from persecuting the church to preaching the gospel, to planting churches, to going on missionary journeys. Missionary journeys. So where we end up today in chapter 27 and 28 is Paul has just finished his third missionary journey. He ended up getting into some trouble. Every time he preached the gospel, it seems like he, he, he ruffled feathers. He was arrested. He ended up from... Um, Jerusalem. He ended up in, in Caesarea, which is about 55 miles away. There were two plans to try to get him back to Jerusalem so people could ambush him and kill him. It would be like if we were going to walk today from here to Lincoln, right? It would take us a while, right? Well, he ended up in Caesarea for two years. He ended up, and he was jailed for two years. He spoke and appealed his case to the governor Felix, and then Felix ended up stepping down, and Festus took over. He was forgotten about. He spoke and pleaded his case to Festus, and then King Agrippa. That's where we were last week. And when he was appealing and sharing and preaching, he appealed to Caesar. So King Agrippa agreed, Festus agreed, to send him to Caesar in Rome. So that's what we're going to pick up today. Paul is going to be put on a ship, and this will be his first voyage as a prisoner. What's going to happen? Well, I'm so glad that you, so glad that you asked. I have a map here, and um, this will be up for a, a portion of our, our, the rest of our time together. And you will see just how extensive this, I, I, it's not a missionary journey. This is a voyage where he is going to Rome as a a prisoner, and there are some bumps along the way. There is a shipwreck along the way. But what we're going to see today is even when you're in a storm, God is faithful. Amen? And if we could give this, this message a title today, it would be Shake It Off. All right? So look at someone next to you and say, Shake It Off. Now watch this video by Taylor Swift. No, I'm kidding. All right. So... <laughs> So they're like, what? <laughs> so here's what happened. So they, they, Paul, he's on the ship. They're headed for Italy, and they had made, they had stopped at one port. They're back at sea, and Paul had warned them, listen, we, we shouldn't go yet because there's danger ahead. And even though the crew was listening, they still 
obeyed the captain instead. And they went out at sea, and they ended up in a northeaster. We're talking a catastrophic storm, and it literally blew them out to sea, and it be, they began throwing cargo overboard. They began throwing gear overboard. So I'm going to pick it up, and we're in chapter 27, verse 20. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until all hope was gone. Everybody say hope. It's not a good place to be when you feel like hope is gone. How many have been there before? You've been there where you felt like, you know what? I'm out of hope. I'm at the end of my rope. I need some Jesus, right? These guys were at the end of the rope. They felt like all hope was gone. So Paul, he gathered them all together. God gave gave him favor with, with the commander, even though he was a prisoner. In fact, at one of their stops, they even let him go for three days, and he was out ministering to people, right? So now he's on this ship. Everybody's lost their hope. So he uses this as an opportunity. He's going to shake off the storm, and he's going to instill some hope by talking about a faithful God. But the first thing he says is this. You should have listened to me, (laughs) right? Parents, have you ever said that before? <laughs> you should have listened. I was, uh, when the kids were saying, hey, hey, sign me up, I'll clean the bathroom, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to vacuum. I mean, I know some of your parents like, what, they're going to start doing this at home too. <laughs> All right. Save people, serve people. You go serve me, kids. <laughs> All right. All right. So anyway, so Paul, he's gathered together. He gets everybody together. He says, you should have listened to me. Verse 22, but take courage. Everybody say, Take courage. I know all hope is gone. You guys are freaked out. We haven't seen the sun. We haven't seen the stars. The waves are rocking this boat. It feels like we're all going to die. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. Now, if I'm on that boat and I'm hearing this man of God say that, I'm encouraged that no one's going to lose their lives, but I'm going to freak out as soon as he says, but the ship's going down, right? Like, wait a minute, what's going to happen? Well, here's what he says, verse 23. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve came and stood behind me. I love this. An angel just showed up and puts his hand on Paul. We had some kids touched at mission camp. It's the same God. It's the same Holy Spirit, right? God sent angels all throughout Scripture. I believe he sends angels today. In fact, Hebrews says, are not angels ministering spirits, flames of fire sent forth to minister to those who are heirs of salvation? Did you know that you are not just an heir, you're a joint heir with Christ? An angel's been sent forth to minister on our behalf. Psalms 91 says that he gives his angels charge over us. Even when we're on a ship and it's rocking, it looks like we're going to drown, he will protect us. How many believe that? You believe believe the word. He uses angels as messengers. Psalms 103 verse 20 says the angels, they listen. They listen. They hearken unto the voice of the word. In other words, the word of God is like angel food, right? They have to obey God. And when we pray, we speak the word, he dispatches angels. When we talk to God, Daniel, when he prayed, what happened? A decree was given in heaven. Daniel chapter 10, for the moment you prayed, three weeks later when the angel showed up, he said, the mo- I'm here in response to your words. I'm here in response to your prayer because when you prayed, from the moment you prayed, 21 days ago, a decree was issued in heaven. And I was sent to give you this message, but I was doing battle. There's spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6 confirms that in I was doing battle with the prince of Persia, but Michael the archangel came and assisted me, and now I'm here to give you this word. This is a great reminder that even in silence, God is moving. Amen? We have to keep praying. We have to keep trusting. We have to keep believing. And if he has to send an angel to you, he will. I've shared this story before several years ago. Jason uh, up here playing bass with the beer. We were on a ski trip. He lost his wallet. We had to fly home that day. You need your license to be able to get on a plane to come home. It was almost freak out mode. Like, man, we got to leave. We have already looked everywhere. We've to the, the cabin that we were in, we already tore the room that we were staying in. I mean, we tore it up. We could not find that wallet. And finally, 
I said, let's pray. So we began to pray out loud. And he's walking around. I'm walking. We're checking everywhere. And I just said, Jesus, your word says that angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those that are heirs of salvation. We're joint heirs. Your word says they hearken. They have to listen to the voice of the word. Your word says, ask anything in my name, and I will do it, even if it means finding the wallet. So, Jesus, I thank you that you are dispatching your angels to put the wallet in Jason's hand in Jesus' name. And as I said that, he had flipped the bedspread. The wallet flew up in the air and landed in his hand, just like that. There's no other explanation other than that God is faithful. Angels are real. This is not just a story in Scripture. This is truth. Do you believe it? So Paul tells them, last night, an angel of God came to me. He stood beside me. He said, don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. That confirms, hey, I'm not going down with the ship. I'm going to make it. I'm going to stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. I mean, it's in moments like this that you want to be around the man of God, right? Whoever, I mean, you want to be around somebody who's got a direct line to God. How many, when you're hurting, when you're struggling, you need somebody, there are somebody in your life that you're going to try to get a hold of. I need you to pray for me. I need you to be with, I need you, right? Because you, I know you got the direct line and it says that right then. It's, It's a good thing because he was going to grant safety to everyone that was sailing with Paul. So it's a good thing Paul was on the boat in the storm, when Jesus was with his disciples, what happened? They were all freaked out. He was sleeping. He got up after they woke him up. Don't you care? We're going to drown. What did he say? Where's your faith? Why didn't you doubt? Remember that? Why did you doubt? And he, and he just spoke to the elements. Peace be still. And everything just, whoop, just like that. Storm over. They were blown away, and then Jesus told them, listen, you guys have the authority to do this. So it's often asked, where, where, where's the safest place to be in the middle of a storm? And the answer is in a boat with Jesus. And if Jesus gets out of boat, hey, you get out of the boat and walk on water, right? It's all about Jesus. Tap somebody and say, God's faithful. So here's what Paul continues to say. He says, take courage, guys. I know you're freaked out of your minds right now. This storm is, it's, it's legit, man. We've been in it for two weeks. He says, take courage because I believe God. I love that. I believe God. How many of you in this room today, you believe God? I believe God. When there's no hope, I believe God. When I need a miracle, I believe God. When I get a bad report, when I get some bad news, when my phone blows up, when I feel like I can't get up, when I can't get out of bed, I'm not going to make it. I don't know how the storm is ever going to end. I believe God. That's what Paul says. Then he says this. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island, right? Oh, crap, (laughs) right? So here's what happens. After 14 days in the eye of the storm, the sailors were praying for daylight. It's amazing how storms make some people pray that have never prayed before, right? And they finally began to listen to Paul. If we fast forward to verse 33, it says, just as the day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. He says, you guys have been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks. Please eat something now for your own good, for not a hair on your head will perish. Then he took some bread. He gave thanks to God before them all, and he broke off a piece, and he ate it. Then everyone was encouraged and began to eat. It says all 276 of us who were on board. Who was writing that? Luke. Luke was a physician. He was an eyewitness. He wrote the Gospel of Luke. He wrote this account of Acts. What a miracle in that moment. Have you ever been so distraught and so broken in life that you can't eat? Right, some of you guys, you've been there before, and, and 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 you lost weight, not the way you wanted to. It was because of hardship. It was because a storm. That was what was going on right here. They were so terrified they didn't even want to eat. In this moment, God uses Paul to shake off that fear, to break bread, and just thank God that they were going to be okay. So after eating, they began to throw everything overboard. 
They ended up hitting, hitting shallow ground. They hit like a, like a sandbar, and they got stuck. And the scripture says that the wind and the waves were beating the boat so hard that the boat, this big ship, began to break apart. And when the ship started breaking apart, the soldiers wanted to kill all the prisoners because Paul wasn't the only prisoner on the ship. There were several. But Paul had favor with the commander, and the commander's like, listen, let's don't, don't kill the dude who says we're all going to make it, right? <laughs> let's, not, let's not kill the guy who's trying to encourage us. And because the commander believed what Paul was saying, he said, don't kill any prisoner. But he did command everyone who knew how to swim to dive in and get to shore. Could you imagine swimming to shore during a storm? But the word of God was no one's going to drown. Even the guys who couldn't swim, the scripture says that they just began to grab on to pieces of the boat, pieces of the wood. How many of you, you're like, you know what? There are things in the ocean that can eat me. I will never get in it. Anybody like that in this room? Okay. All right. Anybody like, I don't care. I will swim with sharks, whatever. I'm in, right? So when I was 16, I went on a mission trip to Jamaica. And on our last day, we had some downtime. All of, our, all of the, the, the ministry part of the trip was over, so we had our, our final couple days off, and we got to go to Montego Bay, no problem, man, no problem, man. And we got to go on this sailboat excursion in the Caribbean, and we got to go snorkeling. And I'll never forget, because the captain of the sailboat that we were on, his name was Hector the Protector. <laughs> I still remember it. I felt safe just because his name was Hector the Protector. When we got back late in the afternoon, early evening, obviously on a large sailboat, you can't bring that in to the dock. It has to anchor a few hundred yards away from the dock, and they would send these little boats to pick us up. So Hector the Protector said, is anyone brave enough to swim back? I was 16. <laughs> I'm like, I'm in. No problem, man. Go. Seriously? He gave me the green light. I dove off top of that, that ship, that sailboat, and I, I dove in, and I started swimming. I got about halfway to the docks, and I remembered a movie that I had watched right before the trip called Jaws. <laughs> what I didn't share was earlier in the day, while we were snorkeling, I cut my knee open on a ladder. Panic set in. I want you to know that. All I could think about was jaws and sharks can smell blood for miles. I know I'm about to be eaten. That's, that's what was going through. My, and I began to pray as I, I was swimming. I mean, I, and I, in a moment, just briefly turned into an Olympic swimmer. I want you to know that. Man, I was praying Psalm 91 and drinking seawater, and I, I, I really did. I got back to the docks before the boats were even able to get the people and get back. Man, I was there. I was like, thank you, Jesus. I will never do that again. I can't imagine that happening in a storm, right? We're talking about this shipwreck. The, the whole boat has been broken apart. Some are hanging on to pieces, but it says that everyone escaped, so chapter 28, we got 28, we got to wrap this up. Once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. The people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. As Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake bit him. Wow, you think you've had a bad day, right? They barely make it to shore alive during a storm. He can probably hardly breathe. Out of breath, thank God there's a fire. Oh, how about getting bit by a viper, right? That's crazy. And it says that when this poisonous snake bit him, all the people on the island assumed he was a murderer. They knew he was a prisoner. Now they thought the worst. This dude definitely killed some people because otherwise he would have been bit by this poisonous snake. And they all just watched and waited for him to drop dead. But he didn't drop dead. What did he do? He just shook off the snake into the fire. They were mesmerized. And because he didn't drop dead, then they just assumed 
that he was a God. He wasn't a God, but he had the Holy Spirit of God inside of him. And then God used that as an opportunity because the chief official decided to welcome Paul and everyone, all 276 of these people, into, into his estate. And the Holy Spirit began, to, everybody just say, shake it off, right? They shook off the fear, he shook off the snake, and now he's going to have the opportunity to preach and pray for the sick. Because this chief official, his name was, was Publius, his father-in-law had a fever and dysentery, so Paul prayed for him and he got healed. And when he got healed, these people who thought he was a murderer all of a sudden wanted him to pray for them. So they brought all the sick, and Paul laid hands on all of them, and it says, other sick people came, and all were healed. Somebody say, shake it off. So the journey, when Paul left for Italy on the very first ship, it began in early fall of 59 AD, as you can see on the map. But here's what, sometimes when you read Scripture, you don't realize how much time is passing Sometimes when you read through the book of Acts and you think when you get to chapters 27 and 28, you think that he's just on this, on this boat for a few weeks and then they, he finally gets there. No, no, no. They left in 59, in the fall of 59 AD, and they got there the following spring in 60 AD. Almost a year and a half later. But he got there alive. He did ministry along the way. Now he gets to Rome, and he's placed in house arrest. Let me pick it up in verse 20. Here's what happens. Um, he says this, I asked you to come here today so we could get acquainted and so that I could explain to you that I am bound with this chain. So he was in house arrest, and he invited all the Jewish leaders to the house that he was staying. He couldn't go to them, so he invited all the Jewish leaders to come to him. So he says, the reason I, I asked you to come here today and the reason I'm in chains, the reason I'm a prisoner is because I simply believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. Now, the reason he told them this is because these Jewish leaders were still waiting for the Messiah. They missed it when Jesus showed up. They did not believe Jesus was the Messiah. They were waiting for a military to show up and rescue them from Rome. So Paul was saying, look, the hope of Israel, the Messiah, he has already come. His his name is Jesus. You guys killed him. He is real. I went from persecuting followers who believed in this, and now I believe it because I experienced Jesus. How many here you've experienced Jesus before? So it doesn't matter what anybody tells you when he heals you, when he delivers you, when he sets you free, when he restores your marriage, when he extends provision, when he shows up and shows off in your life. It doesn't matter who says God is dead. You say, no, I believe because I experienced Jesus. That's what he was saying in this moment. We want to hear, this is what they said. We want to hear what you believe. For the only thing we know about this movement is that it is denounced everywhere. People were enemies of the way. Followers of the way. Christians. They were called followers of the way because Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But all these Jewish religious leaders, they didn't believe it. So now they're, they're intrigued by what Paul was saying. This is denounced everywhere. He's going to use this as, as this opportunity. You know, I, I do a TikTok Live every Thursday night where I get together with hundreds of other people, and a lot of them are Christians, a lot of them are not. I've had the opportunity to lead people to Jesus on the lives, be able to pray with people over prayer requests, and it's just been a really cool community that God has put together. But every single week, there are people that get on the live, and they denounce what I'm saying. There's people say, I'm an atheist, I don't believe that, God is dead, God is this, God is this, hell Satan, blah, 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 blah. And they all think that they're going to detour us. But when you experience Jesus, it doesn't matter who denounces him. It doesn't matter what anybody says. Nobody is ever going to persuade me to walk away from Jesus. Why? Because I have experienced him. 
Paul had an encounter with Jesus that changed his life. Verse 23, so a time was set, and on that day, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and he testified about the kingdom of God, and he tried to persuade them about Jesus, and he used the scriptures. He used the law of Moses. Using the law of Moses and the books of the prophets, the reason he used them is because the Jewish religious leaders had them all memorized. I mean, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the writings of the prophets, they were familiar with Isaiah. All these scriptures point to Jesus, but they had missed it. So Paul was using the scriptures they had memorized to reveal to them that Jesus was real, that Jesus was the Messiah, that Jesus was alive. And it says that he spoke to them from morning until evening. I mean, every Sunday afternoon about 4 o'clock, I'm usually out cold, just so you know. After preaching just two times here, that does me in. Last week, I had to preach twice, and then I had to come back in the afternoon to preach live in Central America and South America with an interpreter. I slept two days after that. <laughs> no, not really. This guy is preaching from morning until evening. Here's the result, and I want you to pay attention to this, and then we're going to wrap up. Some were persuaded by the things he said, but others still didn't believe. We're never going to reach everyone. Jesus said it's a narrow gate and few find it. But what has been one of the themes through all 28 chapters of this book? Some is worth it. You responded, you're worth it. Some of you watching at home, you responded, you're worth it. There are many that will still mock. There are still people that I have to mute every Thursday night on my live. There will be people that won't ever respond but some is worth it that's really the theme of this book some is worth it verse 25 says and after that they argued back and forth among themselves and they left with this final word from Paul and this will be our final word the book of Acts the Holy Spirit was right when he said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet. And then he quotes prophet Isaiah. Go and say to this people, when you hear what I say, you won't understand. And when you see what I do, you won't comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened so their ears can't hear. And they have closed eyes so their eyes cannot see. And their ears cannot hear. And their hearts cannot understand. And they cannot turn to me and let me heal them. So I want you to know that this salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles. And they will accept it. And there were some people, the scales came off. And they believed. You see, the scripture says that the God of this world is Satan. The God of this world, and that's why so much bad stuff is happening right now. He's the God of this world, and he has blinded the eyes of those so they can't receive the gospel, which is why we pray. We ask the Holy Spirit to move so blinders come off, so people will say yes. And even though many will say no, and even though some people will think you're crazy, some will say yes, and it's worth it. So for the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him. Verse 31, the final verse boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I love this. It says, and no one tried to stop him. Why? Because Matthew 16, 18 is the key scripture for Rock Church. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. No matter what kind of storm we find ourselves in, we win. Amen? Can you stand with me? I like everybody just to close your eyes. I don't want to assume that everyone in this room has surrendered their life to Jesus. And I want you to know I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out to anybody else. I'm not going to make you come up front. But as your eyes are closed, let me ask you a question. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you confessed Jesus to be your Lord? Maybe you're unsure. Maybe you think you 
you've done that, but I, I, I don't know. So ask yourself this, if you would die today and you would stand before God, would you spend eternity in his presence or away from his presence? And if you can't answer that, you need to be sure. So his heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're not sure and you want to be sure, just put your hand up, put it down. Anybody like that today? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. One last thing as eyes are closed. Is there anybody here to say, you know what, Chuck? I am a Christian. There was a point where I surrendered my life to Jesus, but I, I realized, I realized now I haven't been as faithful as I want to be. I want the boldness of Paul. I want to share my faith. I want to live for God. But it's hard. Will you pray for me? If that's you, just put your hand up, put it down. A lot of hands all throughout this room. Thank you. Now let's do what we always do every single week. I want everyone, every one of us to pray out loud, even you at home. Everybody say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today I surrender my life to you. I turn from my sins. I'm running to you. Because I believe the Bible is true. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe you were raised from the dead. So because of my faith, I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm going to be with you forever. So help me to be your witness here and to represent you well and stay faithful. In Jesus' name. God, as we leave this place today, I thank you that you are strengthening everyone in this room. You are giving us the boldness we need. God, as we have prayed this, we know that your Holy Spirit is on the... God, that we are your church. We're going to gather as your church, and we're going to grow as the church. It's all for you. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's thank God for his faithfulness today. Amen. Amen.